Uh, hello, welcome to our encouragement for the day. Uh, here at uh, at Colonial Heights Church, we uh, offer some devotions uh, of three, four, five days a week, whatever uh, we're able to do. And um, uh, this week, we're going to talk about repentance. Uh, last week was confession. The week before was faith. Um, we're just kind of covering some basic things here. Repentance is a, a change of heart and life. It is having godly sorrow uh, where we realize that we've committed sins and the sins that we've committed are hurtful to God and odious to God. God is holy and wants us to be holy. Uh, he's given us his power so that we can become more like him, more holy and without sin. But we as human beings fail and we falter. We, we make bad choices. And a lot of times we hurt other people. We uh, go against what God says. And so repentance is needed. Um, let me let me talk about a few things. Um, I've come to certain conclusions, uh, and I mentioned one already. My sin hurts God, and that's why there had to be punishment for sin. And praise God, He sent His Son Jesus to die for our sins, so that we become a living sacrifice, as opposed or as as according to what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, as opposed to the sacrifice on the cross that Jesus became or the, the, uh, the lamb uh, in, the, in the Passover sacrifice or the atonement uh, in the Old Testament times that shed its blood so that that person who offered it up could receive forgiveness. Uh, there was nothing about the heart in that. Hopefully it was pained. The heart was pained by the sacrifice the animal had to make. And hopefully we understand the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. But it's not just, oh my, why did he have to die for me? It's as much that my sin is the cause of so much of my own misery, so much of the misery in the world, so much of the, the lack of hope and promise that people have. Um, Another thing, a uh, conclusion I've come to is that without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without repentance. And where I see that really taking effect a lot is that people who maybe come to Christ or seem to, uh, but they have no walk with the Lord after a time. And it might be quickly, it might be distant future, uh, but they, they eventually reject the Lord completely. There's no repentance there at that point. Why, why would they repent if they don't believe that God has a, has played a role in their lives or in their future? And so repentance is a, a way to humble ourselves or even to humiliate ourselves before him uh, to, to understand our need for what, what he has done. A lot of times I find for myself that, that uh, communion time at church it's one reason I'm thankful that our church takes communion every week, and I'm thankful that we have meditations by uh, our elders and church leaders and uh, those who uh, are comfortable speaking and knowledgeable of the scripture, that kind of thing. But at communion time, so many times when I bow my head to pray and I'm holding in my hand a little piece of bread, <laughs> more like cardboard these days, uh, matzah, unleavened bread, whatever, whatever your church uses. And it represents Jesus' body. And it, the cup, you kind of smell the little bit of aroma from the grape juice, kind of wafts up your nostrils. And it's, a, it's reminiscent by appearance, especially of, of Jesus' blood that was shed because of my sin, because he had no sins of his own. And so at communion time, and, and I think that there are lots of times during the week that in our prayer times, we should confess to the Lord our sins and we should desire to confess every sin that we commit. I don't believe that that's essential to be forgiven. I think that there needs to be an attitude of repentance, uh, a spirit of repentance, of a desire to have that godly sorrow or having that godly sorrow and a desire to see a change in our lives because that's a lot of what repentance is. Yes, it's sorrow for sin. We'll see in 2 Corinthians 7, especially godly sorrow, as Paul describes it there. 
but it's it's more than that. It's a desire for a change in the direction of my life, a change in my heart and in my mind, my way of thinking, my way of treating other people. Um, it's, it's a desire to surrender myself more and more uh, to the Lord so that I can walk more closely with him. Well, let's take a look at some scriptures. Um, Jesus, uh, well, let's start with Matthew 3, 8. John the Baptist told the people that they needed to pr produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit means what shows in your life? What, what do people see? Do they see somebody who's arrogant and haughty and prideful in their sin and sinfulness? That should never be the Christian. That should never be the believer because when we see what Jesus went through for us, it humbles us. We've already talked about this a little bit, but John tells the people who came out to the Jordan River to hear him that they had to change their lives. It's not just, yes, I sinned, dupe, you get dumped in the water and come up and you know, uh, when you when you go in a, a dry center and you come up a wet center, it doesn't really do that much good, does it? That's why we have to have faith and repentance. We have to confess the name of Jesus as well as confess our sinfulness. Then when we're baptized, now we're coming to Christ. Now we are, are accepting his terms of the covenant or the contract that he will place his spirit in us. He'll forgive our sins. We have his help in understanding the word, understanding life in this world and the one to come. All that includes repentance or it's nothing at all. If we don't, excuse me, if we don't see our sin, then how can we accept what Jesus has done or receive what he has done? So producing fruit means that over time our lives change and people see God living in us and see us walking with him. In, in Matthew 4, 17, uh, not long after Jesus was baptized, uh, at least in the, in the timeline here of, of Matthew, um, and, and it's actually after, it's listed after the temptation of Jesus. And I, I think that that's the right order. Jesus' baptism in the wilderness for temptation and, uh, and then you know, begins to preach and teach. From that time on, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So changes are happening. And it started with John the Baptist. When John came on the scene, the people got excited because God's doing something. God's showing them something. Now here comes Jesus. John had said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And here's Jesus proclaiming repentance. If we don't repent, we're going against what the scripture says. We're going against what Jesus said. If we want to be part of the kingdom of God, repentance is essential. That means drawing near to him, having the right mindset about our sin. Well, when the church began, Acts chapter 2, when the new covenant is introduced or the new contract with God <coughs> is introduced, <coughs> well, Peter's preaching, at least that's the one who's quoted here, and it says, when the people heard this, that this Jesus, whom they had seen and mistreated and turned over to the Romans to be crucified, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Now, I would take this to be some type of a belief, a belief that Jesus is going to be the solution to their problems. Now, we're not told if after they say this and Peter tells them to repent and be baptized. I don't know that they immediately went to the water wherever it was uh, to be baptized, probably the pool of Siloam or, or something like that. But I'm sure that there were lots of things that they were talking about, about Jesus, who he really was and what he did and why he did it and what their response was supposed to be. But Peter's response to them is summarized as repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So Peter tells them to repent. In other words, okay, you're cut to the heart you realize that something different is happening here and you need 
uh, forgiveness. You need to be let off the hook. What Jesus did for you is what you need to have. And that is the forgiveness and, and the help of the Holy Spirit. All these are included in this 38th verse. But the first word is repent. Come into a right relationship with God when you believe in him and, and what he has done. And, you know, the people were very faithful Jews. I'm sure they believed in God already. They had heard of Jesus, but they hadn't surrendered themselves to him. Surrender to him comes in the form of repentance and being baptized. Now, I know some people today make baptism a work, and they say you can't work to be saved. Uh, there's a problem with that. The Bible never describes baptism as a work. Now, people can make it a work, I understand, but when there is faith, in other words, believing in God and putting your trust in him, when there is repentance, a true sorrow for sin and a desire to, to walk with God, then baptism is simply a, a surrender to God. It's simply doing what God has told you to do. It's coming into the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. When we're baptized into Christ, we die to sin and die to self. Look at Romans chapter 6 about this, by the way. When, when, we are, when we go into the water, it's a picture of being buried with him. When, when we come up out of the water, it's the picture of being raised up with him. We'll probably talk more about baptism next week, but it's a, it's a natural flow out of putting our trust in him, repenting of our sins, knowing we need his forgiveness. So we need to be like him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 2 uh, is a fascinating passage, starting with verse 3. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So what's Paul talking about here? He's really hitting hard on some of the Christians in Rome. And I think we'll find that he had not been to Rome. Maybe he had met some of the ones. And that's why Romans 16 has all this list of people in it that he wants them to greet so that they can all kind of say, who is this guy, Paul? What, what has he done? They can The ones who knew him could share that. But some of the people were extremely hypocritical. And they were putting down on people who were doing bad things. Now, now that part's not wrong, except they were doing the same things. They were were acting against what God said, and yet they were putting others down who were doing the same things. That's why Paul says, when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, yet do the same things. You know, God's going to be hateful toward that. Um, when we see our own sin, or when we see the sins of others, we need to look at our own sin. Um, Galatians 6, 1 and 2 talk a little bit about this, about being careful when you help other people see their sin, be careful that you don't do the same thing. Well, Paul's solution here is repentance. You know, you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. A lot of times we look at the trials that people go through and say, yeah, God's trying to get their attention. God's trying to get them to repent. But God's kindness you know, we ought to look at the amazing lives that we have. And even if they're not perfect, even if they're not exactly what we want or thought our lives would be, but to know the incredible lives that we have should point out the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the need for us to be close to him and to change our lives and our hearts so that we are repentant and truly letting go of the sins that are in our lives, the bad and wrong attitudes that we have. Well, one more passage real quickly, 2 Corinthians 7, starting with verse 8. Paul in 2 Corinthians, uh, he wasn't sure how they would respond to his first letter. He says, even if I caused you sorrow by my first letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. 
See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice uh, done in every point. You have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So by innocent, it means their, their, their mindset, even though they were wrong in what they had done before. And, and the man in their church who was living in sin, they had not confronted him to help him see how he needed to repent. But now they also have repented. And by the way, that guy repented. And Paul tells him to welcome him back. You know, don't leave him out there for Satan to pick him off. But instead, have this godly sorrow. So Romans 2 talks about the kindness of God. Let you, let you see my thumb here. 2 Corinthians 7 talks about the, the sorrows and the trials that we go through. Most of them or many of them by our own decisions, especially sinful or wrongful decisions. So we need to come back to Christ. We need to humble ourselves. We need to confess our sins. We need to repent. You know, repentance is a change of the heart, a change of, of the mind, a change of the life, and it's godly sorrow. May we always draw near to him. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have of knowing Jesus and having the truth about ourselves and our need to draw near to you through repentance. Thank you, Father, for being with us. Help us to be encouraged by the knowledge that you forgive us, you draw us near. Father, you are still at work in and by your spirit in us. Thank you, Father, through Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a great day.